Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Michael Shuckman. I believe my voice should be heard on the on the call. So let's click on the next slide. Uh, again, my name is Michael Shuckman. I'm the host for today. I'm the software practice leader here at MicroStrategies. With me is Dwayne Snow. He's a data warehouse and OLTP expert with IBM and also a competitive analyst in that space. In the room, we have a couple of customers and a couple of micro strategies folks as well. So if there's any background noise, I apologize. We're trying a live webinar today. So those of you dialing in, thank you. And those of you that came today, thank you as well. I guess you guys get to ask your questions at the end uh, via voice. So the agenda for today is we'll give you a quick overview of micro strategies, uh, an overview of a BI practice, do a deeper dive into the IBM Pure Data System for Analytics, uh, specifically the part powered by Natiza, and then we'll do a questions and answer session. So, who is MicroStrategies? First off, we are not that company called MicroStrategy, the one word with a Y. We're the two words with an S. So we've been around six years longer than that other company. We've been uh, celebrating our 30th year now, established in 1983. We, we're an IBM premier business partner one of 12 in the country that buy direct from IBM and have a direct relationship with IBM. We also have an extensive Microsoft practice focusing largely on portals and collaboration. We have offices in North Jersey and in uh, Malvern, Pennsylvania, covering basically from Boston to, Bo to DC. Each of our two offices has what's called a BPIC, a Business Partner Innovation Center, which is a lab for our customers and prospects to use at no charge. In each of the labs, uh, interconnected labs. We have about $2 million of IBM hardware, basically every model of the hardware portfolio. In addition, all of the IBM software for the BI, BA stack, uh, and many other IBM software products. So all those are available for customers, like I said, do proof of concepts, test points, pull out cables, test failover, and test replication over the wire. In addition, the teases are going to be installed shortly. We'll have two twin fin 12s, one on each location, and we'll be helping customers understand test uh, Netiza replication, which is another topic for another webinar, but a recently announced product that will help you replicate between various Netiza appliances. In addition, we also have extensive cloud practice, and we actually actually have a couple of customers actually doing work in the cloud, which is a rare thing these days to actually have a successful implementation, I believe. Um, as an IBM partner, we get surveyed extensively by IBM. Uh, and monitored, and we continually have in the high 90s on customer satisfaction. Many of our customers have been with us, some of them for 30 years, many for 20, and many, you know, additionally, for obviously for 15 and 10. Some of you are on the call as well, so I appreciate that. Of the 110 employees here at Micro, we have about 20 salespeople, and everyone else is largely technical and on the implementation side, and we have an extensive array of certifications from IBM and other vendors. And lastly, we have a full-time staffing wing called Resource One, which has helped us double in size over the last four years and also helps our customers find staff augmentation for short-term and or permanent full-time hiring positions as needed both in BI and general IT. The company is broken up into two large divisions, the Business Solutions Group and the Advanced Infrastructure Group. The Advanced Infrastructure Group is largely the IBM hardware conversation and, uh, and Microsoft and Citrix. So again, all servers, storage, and networking components largely from IBM. Uh, extensive practices with virtualization, consolidation, security, desktop, remote, uh, remote desktop, high performance computing, uh, replication, high availability. The majority of today's call will be focused on the business solutions group, specifically the business intelligence, business anal analytics team which I'm leading the sales effort, and we have about 12 full-time individuals with about probably 15 years each for per each person experience in the data warehousing and BI uh, industry. In addition to the BI team, we have an extensive ECM or enterprise content management practice. Uh, again, from a Microsoft perspective, we do a lot with portals and collaboration. We have an application development team. We have about 30 in-house Java and .NET developers. Um, and various other things, including a digital voice recording practice. So looking at the business intelligence team, it's as I said, it's comprised of about a dozen individuals at the moment, and it's fully focused on end-to-end -end analytics. The, the primary focus of the team is data, so all phases of data, determining where the data is, how do we align the data to the customer's requirements, 
and then build the appropriate tool sets and, and visualization metrics to help the customer achieve their goals. We spend a lot of time on the right-hand side of this equation, doing requirements analysis, BI assessments, doing the road mapping, really spending much, most of the time determining where all the appropriate data is, how do we make sure it's valid and accurate, to then what I might call the easier part at that point is making, you know, visualizing it. Because um, making sure it's accurate is obviously a much trickier part. Along the way, we have the implementation team. Uh, in addition to configuring and architecting it, we spend a lot of time with our customers implementing the solutions, whether that being the TISA, SPSS, Cognos, et cetera. But today we'll be spending a lot of time talking about the TISA. Um, one or two customer examples we've done in the past with the TISA, working with a large retailer, we've helped them migrate from the TISA, uh, from Teradata to Natiza, and also with some other customers um, with large data sets. Uh, so a couple of big data customers helping them manage a, a multiple in the T's environment and all the nuances around managing the data and the complexities with reporting that come with that. So with that is a brief overview of micro strategies. I'll hand it off to Dwayne Snow for, uh, for a deeper dive into pure data systems for analytics. Thanks, Michael. So as Michael said, my name is Dwayne Snow and I'm with IBM. I'm on the product um, marketing and competitive team with IBM. So I spend a lot of time meeting with our customers, but also talking to, to you folks, our customers, and talking about what we believe are the business benefits, the business value of both the pure data system for analytics, which is the powered by Natiza. So if you're used to the Natiza offering, if you've already bought Natiza, this is just the next generation Natiza appliance. So the, the pure data system for analytics is still powered by Natiza and, ha and has all of the same same benefits of the Natiza platform. We really haven't changed the, the core tenants of Natiza, which are, you know, the simplicity, the time to value, and all that stuff. So this still is that, that system. So what I'm going to talk about today is really, you know, what are the challenges that we see organizations facing and how business analytics helps drive a better outcome, better business outcomes. Because you can, if, if you just take your data and you just store your data, it's a liability. If somebody gets into it and sees it that shouldn't see it, you're in trouble. So without deriving value, analyzing your data, deriving insight and value from it, it is a liability. It's only Data is only an asset when you're using it, when you're running your analytics on it, when you're deriving value from that. And that business analytics, though, requires typically a data warehouse. You have to bring your data together somewhere, somehow. So that's really the foundation for that analytics. We're going to talk about some accelerators. What you know? What is really built into the pure data system for analytics that helps accelerate that division of, of value, that time to value from your data? And then I'm going to talk briefly about something new, something exciting and new in the pure data for analytics family. So Michael talks about this, and and the video showed um, showed this. Today we're just getting overwhelmed with data. We're generating data in massive volumes. We're generating 15 petabytes of data every day. Any of you have a teenager? Twitter, you know, Twitter, Facebook, text messages. They never phone anybody anymore. It's all text messaging, um, instant, instant messaging, Instagram, everything, pictogram. Everything is generating digital information faster than ever before. Most of it, not much value in it. <laughs> but you'd be surprised at some of the value you can derive from that or the value, you, or not necessarily value, but the information you can get from it. So one of the guys, um, they do that Mythbusters show, fairly popular, you know, the guy took a picture of his Jeep and posted it on Instagram or on Twitter. Well, he wasn't smart enough to turn off his geographic information on his smartphone before he took the picture. So anybody that downloaded that picture, that saw it, knew exactly geographical coordinates where his house is. So you need to understand that just by putting something out there, there's, there's a whole bunch of other information behind it and being able to understand what information is available. And, you know, not everybody can see, you know, there's the information that you want to get out of it, but then there's the other information that's there that, you know, not necessarily the most honest people are looking for as well. So there's information comes from both ends, the stuff you, you generate that you want to generate. And then there's other stuff that's really associated with that. That's, attached to it that you don't necessarily want people to see, but it's still there. Data is coming in a massive varieties, pictures, text messages, 
emails. So it's not all structured data anymore. And in fact, the vast majority of it is not structured data. Structured data comes from your, your transaction system, your point of sale system. Unstructured is that email, your, twi your, your, your Twitter um, tweet, your Facebook post, all of those. Now, if you look at though, you know, a tweet and a Facebook post, they are somewhat structured. Facebook post you have 128 characters to write what you want. There's header information it's in a JSON format. A tweet, similar to structured format, but freeform text. But the value is not in, well, some of the value is in the structured, who posted it and where, but most of the value is in that unstructured part. And finding the correlation to, you know, Michael saying, I went to Tiffany's and, you know, the price of the stuff was, was too much. Or some other course, I went there and the salesperson mistreated me. So I went somewhere else and bought it. So you, the, the value that you can derive from the data is typically in the unstructured portion. And it's becoming major velocity. The, this, like we said, you know, people are tweeting Facebook. The generation of that data is just growing faster and faster. So when Twitter first came out, you know, one of the biggest events was, um, you know, there's, there's been numerous big events. The tsunami, the Japanese women winning um, gold. And then the biggest one to date, actually the second biggest one, there was one after that, Beyonce announcing she's pregnant. Who cares? Other than, you know, Beyonce and, and Jay-Z, but everybody was tweeting about it. But so that data is just, and, and that's, you know, they generated billions of retweets, tweets of that information. It's just the, va the velocity of that is just growing astronomically. So this is the, the thing that you have to worry about when you're building a system to run that analytics and derive that value that you can from your system. The other big, the other big thing in the industry is that organizations that use analytics drive more profit. They drive more business values. They do get lower costs. And all of that comes down to the profit. So organizations that use analytics are 50% or more more profitable. They're twice as likely to get a significant profit than customers and, and organizations that do not use analytics. If you can reduce risk, that can, you know, is that necessarily a direct value? No, you're not going to get paid back from that, but you then have, don't have to invest in other things to counteract that risk. Predict future outcomes. So if you can do predictive analytics, if you can predict with some confidence that something's going to happen, then you optimize assuming that's going to happen, and you make decisions assuming that's going to happen, and you optimize your output. Optimi optimize your inventory, your sales. So predicting... Um, one of our customers is a large insurance company. So, you know, last year when the hurricanes coming up the East Coast, what do insurance companies do is they reinsure. So the insurance companies go, and, and this is a, a correlation of predicting and also geospatial. They mapped all of their policies to counties. And then they said, and then they, you know, within each county, we don't want to have more than X. So they could actually graph it quickly, you know, red, green, yellow for how much, have they insured within each county along the path of that hurricane? And then within the path, you know, the path is like an ice cream cone, right? You got the line that goes where they think it's, and then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger out from that because there's, there's so much unpredictability as it moves. Now, behind it, they know exactly where it was, but in the, the way it's moving, it could go any direction. So it's, it's that cone of uncertainty. So within that cone, they could determine, where's my risk? Where do I have too much insurance? Then they could call another insurance company and say, will you take some of this off my hands? And they could quickly optimize their total. And then if somebody else called them and said, I've got a policy at X, do you want it? They could look at their graph and say, red, green, yellow. If they're green, they'll take it. If they're yellow or red, don't want it. Optimizing, so predicting and optimizing for the most profit. Or in this case, the most potential loss. Because when you're an insurance company, it's not necessarily profit, it's about how much am I on the hook for if I get a total wipeout of everything in that path, if I have to pay out everything. And this is this slide really talks about the you know the value of that information. So, you know, one in three business leaders are making decisions based on gut. They're saying they don't have the information, they don't trust it. If you have information you don't trust it, what's the value? It's a liability. You have to derive the value from it. 
business leaders, one in every 50% of them don't have access to the data they need. You know, and it's very, very important to build that system and trust your information. And this is the, what, what we call, you know, the analytic enterprise and sort of the, the gamut of analytics. Almost any system can do BI reporting, no matter what. If you have static reports, you can take your database, you can create all the right indexes, all the right aggregates, so they run quickly. But a static report runs the same thing over and over and over and over again. So you can always, you can spend a month, you can spend six months tuning it to get those fast. What if a report changes? What if you get somebody that just comes in with a MicroStrategy, Cognos, SAS, SPSS, click, 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 builds a report and runs it. You have no clue what that query is going to run. And then it's not going to get the right index. It's going to take forever to run. That's ad hoc analysis. So not every system can handle ad hoc well. The Pure Data System for Analytics, because it does not require indexes and aggregates, is perfectly suited for that. And then when we start getting into predictive analytics, we have predictive analytic function calls built into the engine. So the Pure Data System for Analytics comes with the IBM Natiza analytics built in. Over 150 built-in complex analytic functions to do things like predictive modeling, predictive analytics. It runs PMML, PMML4 directly in the engine in that massively parallel processing. So you don't have to pull it out to your predictive server and run it in SMP. You run it in an MPP mode across all of your data. And then the optimizations. The real power of analytics comes from predicting it, trying to get the right prediction with confidence, and then once you have the prediction and the confidence, running all of the models you need to optimize for that. And this, you know, the power of the Pure Data System for Analytics gives you the ability to do this across the platform. Now, you know, like I said, almost anybody can do BI reporting when it's static. The ad hoc and the, the deep complex analytics to do the predictive and the, and the modeling is very, um, you know, is really unique to the Pure Data System for Analytics. And, and this, this is a, a weird correlation. You might think it's weird, but it's something that, that you know, sticks in my mind. Would you use Google if it took three days and seven people to get a result? Because this, to me, is really like the way that analytics are run today. The way I, I talk about analytics today is it's train of thought. You ask a question, you get an answer, then you ask the next question based on the answer you just got. It's not... Report one, report two, report three, report four, always circling through them all, all again. You run a query, and then you run the next query, but you don't know what that second query is. So the analytics train of thought means it's sort of like going, going for a drive, and you're just going to end up somewhere. You can't put an address in a GPS because you don't know where you're going to get. You just know, you know, I'm going to turn left here. You're going to get to the end of the street, and then you're going to have to make another turn. And that's really what train of thought analytics is, is you ask a question, you get an answer, then you ask a new question, you, go, you might go in a completely different direction. And if it took you three days, you already forgot the question you asked. And seven people to, to keep it up and running, it's just too expensive. So you want a system that's going to, if you want to do train of thought, you need to get the answers very quickly so you don't lose the train of thought, you don't lose where you're going, you don't have to come back in three days and give the next question, and that you don't have to have a bunch of people backwards behind the scenes tuning it. So when we talk about traditional data warehouses, traditional data warehouses have a database that's software that has a cache, buffer cache, buffer pool, whatever you want to call it. They have a, runs on a server, and it has its backend storage. And the way it works is you've got to, they make a query, and you've got to go out to the disk and get the I.O. and, and do, move the data into the buffer cache before it can operate on it. So it's all about moving the data across multiple tiers, multiple caches, into the, the software's memory cache before you start the processing, moving the data to the processing. That's an inefficient model when you're talking terabytes, tens of terabytes, or hundreds of terabytes, or even petabytes of data. You can't do that. So what the Pure Data System for Analytics does is it gets rid of those three tiers and gives you a single commodity appliance black box. And it's got fully integrated server software storage and instead of moving the data to the analysis and the analytics, it moves the analytics to the data. It moves the processing to the data. So it operates on the data as it streams from the disk. 
It doesn't have to move it from disk into the disk cache, into the CPU, across into the memory, and then operate on it. So it's moving none of the data. It's doing all of the work as the data flows from disk. So what we've done is we've taken the server, the storage, the database, and the analytics, combining them into a powerful package, and we're integrating them directly in the server. So now, if you run a PMML model, if you're running SAS or SPSS, you want to run predictive, a predictive model of markup language, PMML4 model that you've developed, you don't have to take the data and pull it out to your SAS or SPSS server. It pushes the model and runs it directly in the engine on the hardware in that MPP platform. So the system is all about, again, built-in expertise. So we call this, you know, this is IBM with the Pure Data Systems calls them expert integrated systems. The Natiza appliance, which IBM acquired the Natiza company for $1.7 billion about three years ago, that was really the first true expert integrated system. It took the, the expertise of a number of very, very smart people in the business where, you know, business intelligence and data warehousing um, work, um, work stream, and they built in the, their expertise. So they built a system that doesn't require indexes or aggregates or tuning, can run any data model. So some of our competitors will say, load the data in third normal form, and then if you're running applications, build star or snowflakes, replicate the data into a star or snowflake within the data warehouse to optimize for your application performance. Then if you add a new application, guess what? You gotta re, you know, un denormalize that as well into its own different star or snowflake, so you're duplicating data all over the place. Here, because we don't require indexes or aggregates, you don't have to worry about the data model. Most of the Pure Data System and the TISA customers will just take the data model from their existing app, even if that's their OLTP app, and move it into the Pure Data System for analytics. Now, they're going to drop all their indexes and aggregates because we don't need them. So you're just going to basically take the table definitions, move them in, load the data, and run. It's as simple as that. Fully integrated, and again, it's up and running in hours. So the system comes pre-configured, pre-installed. You plug it into your network and into your power. And typically within three to four hours, we're able to then say, and you know, after that, we have people that do some testing to make sure all the disks are working at the proper speed. So we do some, some check of the hardware just to make sure it's okay, that it's performing well. And then basically just create database. You don't just specify the storage or anything. Create table with the column definitions. And then run your queries. It's as fast as that. Minimal ongoing administration, so you don't have to go in and you know create new aggregates, create new indexes, monitor what objects are being used, and do all of that. And it's got the standard interfaces because all BI tools, analytics tools, ETL tools use ODBC or JDBC or SQL. You don't need to have anything non-standard. You want a standard way of communicating with the system. So the system's really again, it's purpose built for analytics. It's fully integrated, and it's what we call the four S's. Speed, simplicity, scalability, and smart. So it's 10 to 100 times faster and more in our experience with, of existing customers' um, traditional systems. They bring in the Natiza system and they run 10, 100, thousands of times faster in many cases without changing the data model, without having to tune it, without having to create indexes. It's just create the table, load the data, and run. Minimal, again, no tuning, no administration. We can scale to over a petabyte within a single system. And it has that high performance complex analytics built in. When I, and when I talk, you know, 10 to 100 times faster, we have um, a number of customers that have, you know, brought us in and they were running on whether it be Oracle or Teradata or SQL Server or, or other platform. And that have, what they do is they call it a POC. Now we're calling it the pure experience with the pure family. But they have taken that system, you know, taken their queries, taken their application, moved it into the, the Natiza Pure Data System for Analytics platform, and then run their queries. We have customers that have been 16,000 times faster. We have, one of our customers is XO Communications in Europe. They're a telco. So here, you get drop calls. You can call them to Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, whoever, and complain. doesn't matter. You're stuck to your contracts up unless you want to pay the cancellation fee. In Europe... If you're unhappy today, in two minutes you can go into a store and change your phone. Even iPhones in Europe 
can be transferred from carrier to carrier to carrier. That was the, that's the law. You're not stuck with the carrier. So Exo Communications wanted to look at customer churn, and they wanted to look at um, you know when am I getting drop calls? How you know when am I doing um, what percentage are getting drop calls? Who's texting other people? Who's complaining about it? But they also were getting billed back, and even cell phone carriers here, or if, we, if you travel overseas, you get billed back for roaming. So roaming, their customers, because it's Europe, you know, a lot of them are very, very small cell phone carriers. There's a lot more roaming over there. They're, they're closer, they're smaller, more travel between countries than we do here. But they were billed back by their roaming partners X amount. And then they, you know, correlate it, add whatever percentage, and bill it back to the cell phone owners. They were never able to go back and correlate based on the CDRs, call data records, call detail records. When a customer left their tower to when they joined other towers. So they were never able to ensure that what they were billed was right on their previous Oracle system. They got to the teaser, they were running, they were getting things 200 times faster on average than their Oracle system. And then they said, well, let's run that query that checks the roaming. They ran it, it came back in seconds. It's like, okay, this is wrong. They were questioning. They ran it 10 times, same answer every time. So what they then did is break it down into pieces. It was some huge, massive query that they could break into contiguous chunks. They ran each one individually, created temp tables to make sure it was right. Three hours later, after manually doing all that, they got the same answer. So they said, whoa, this has to be right. So they figured out that they were actually overbilled by their roaming partners to the tune of over $10 million. So the system paid for itself. The query that never ran an Oracle finished in seconds on the TISA, and it paid for itself before they even bought it. So they were happy to write the check for the system. I, I talked about this earlier before too. The tools communicate with standard interfaces. That's really what it's all about. No matter how you load the data, how you get it in, how you query it, standard interfaces to get, act, get the data on and access the insight from that data. And this is what I said, I'm going to talk about something new. We just announced um, on the 22nd of this month, January. Is it February? No, still, still January. So this month, <laughs> it's not February, February is tomorrow. So the 22nd of this month, we announced the, new, the next generation Pure Data System for Analytics, the N2001. So last October, we announced the N1001. So in January, we announced the N2001. They both systems are extremely fast. They're high performance, highly scalable. You know, the N1001 is not, a, you know, the N2001 is on average significantly faster than the 1001. So it's the next generation hardware appliance. They both run the same software. So the interaction between them is exactly the same. The simplicity is exactly the same. It's still the fastest time to value. It's optimized for that big data analytics. So none of those four <clears throat> tenants of the design of the system changed. All we've done is we've optimized the hardware design even further to get that big jump in performance. Oh, and the other point on the bottom is, the other, so it's not also faster, it's also more environmentally friendly. I like saying greener, I've been told I shouldn't say it, environmentally friendly. So in the same floor tile space, I can fit 50% more data, run three times faster using the same power and cooling requirements. So without increasing power and cooling, I'm getting faster and more capacity. So it's very environmentally friendly. So the three things that we did with this system is we were accelerating the performance of analytic queries. So again, we're three times faster than the previous generation. So with this system, we're um, generating over 128 gigabytes per second effective scan rate. That's huge. You can scan a lot of data at that rate very, very quickly. 50% more capacity, more capacity and less power per rack than both Oracle and Teradata. The scan rate is higher than Oracle and Teradata, and I'll go into that in a second. And we're improving our system management resilience, and we're expecting about 70% fewer service calls because we have more spare drives, more spare redundancy built within the system. So if we look at scan rates, this goes into scan rate. So the Pure Data system, the N2001, 128 gigabytes per second. 
The Teradata 2690, 38 gigabytes per second. Teradata, or sorry, Oracle Exadata X3, the latest generation, they'll claim we get 100 gigabytes per second scan rate, but that's only from their flash cache. By default, the primary optimization for data warehousing in Exadata is a smart scan. Smart scans, by default, bypass flash cache. They read directly from disk. So the disk scan rate is only 25 gigabytes per second. So, but now Oracle will say, yes, but I can pin it and I can turn on compression. I can get better than that. Doesn't matter because there's between the storage servers and the database servers in Exadata, there's a dual InfiniBand connection. The InfiniBand connection is, has a theoretical limit of 80 gigabytes per second each way. That means so it's 80 gigabytes total, 40 gigabytes each way. So with dual, that's theoretical of 80 gigabytes per second each way. And that's theoretical. So they're not even going to reach 100, no matter whether you use compressions, flash cache, whatever, they're stuck at less than 80. So we're over three times faster than Teradata and 50% faster than Exadata from flash. If we look at so that, that actually, that sync chart is on the right capacity, the XA appliance um, comes with, you know, we have 48 terabytes of available storage. They have just over 40, 42 with Exadata and 18 with the Teradata 2690 appliance. So these two on the right, middle and right, are higher is better. On the left, lower is better because that's power. So I, I think, you know, that the pure data system analysis is really the gift that keeps on giving. It's easier to use, it's faster, but it also, you know, uses less administration and requires less power. So 7.5 kilowatts, 8.2 for Teradata, so, you know, about 10% more, and 11.8 for Exadata. How much does that cost day by day by day that's also adding into the total cost of ownership of the system? So I call this really, you know, the pure data system for analytics, and it's great for that because, and, and we talk about moving the analytics into the engine. And why is that important? Because if you don't move the analytics into the engine, you got to go out, reach into the database, get a sample, and pull it out to your analytics server. Because trying to pull ter hundreds of terabytes or petabytes out to your analytics server, which is simply an SMP server, is not going to work. You're going to be waiting for hours or days to move it out to that analytics server. So why is sampling bad? So this is a customer, I, I've, I've been a customer of this store, and I've bought seven things in the last couple of years, or in the last couple of months. So I go in, I'm buying something, and they say, well, what coupon should I give Dwayne to get him to come back again? Next best offer. It's a common thing in retail. So if they took a sample of this, how are they going to best know what they should give me? Sampling, if they take a two sample, two out of seven, more than 25%, basically, 30%, almost exactly 30%, 29 whatever percent sample, which nobody takes a, a 29 or a 30%. So you're typically talking two, five, 10% sample. They get two things. I bought a tent and a book called Hiking Alaska. Predictive, hey, maybe the person is going hiking in Alaska. It's a good one. I mean, about a tent and that, you might be able to correlate that together. Okay, well, let's make them an offer for, you know, a topographical map of Alaska. People going hiking, use topographical maps. Well, I bought that too. So you need, you've wasted your opportunity to upsell me to get me to come back. Well, what if I take a bigger sample? So now I know three out of seven. Oh, let's give them a portable GPS so he doesn't get lost. Well, guess what? I bought the previous model. You're going to offer me this latest generation model. I bought the previous model last month. I paid full price for it. You're going to offer me a coupon on the, the next generation model for 20% off. I'm going to return my older one, buy the new one, and you're going to get stuck with the old one. How's that next best offer? So unless you look at everything I bought, you can't optimize what that next best offer is going to be. So now that you know everything I bought, the compass, the backpack, the GPS, the sleeping bag, you're not going to offer me a new GPS. You're not going to offer me, what, what am I missing? Boots? Clothes? You know, proper boots? Let's give them the boots that I have my highest profit margin on. Get them to come in. 
Let's try that. You know, and say, you know, send in, if it's boots, better you should be saying, look, we sort of predicted that you might be going hiking. You know you want to have your boots a year ahead of time and break them in because you don't want to get blisters when you go. Come and get them now and start walking around the neighborhood when you walk your dog. That's the kind of thing. That's what the power of moving the analytics into the engine on all your data gets. Sampling would have given you the wrong, most of the time, almost every time would have given you a potentially wrong guess here. For the, again, the simplicity, this also drives that value. The ongoing total cost of ownership drives it down. No indexes, no tuning, no storage administration, no software. So you don't have to have DBAs and Army DBAs. You have data managers, not database administrators. So actually one of our customers is Coach in New York. They actually don't even have a data manager or database administrator. It's just their business users that access the system. And they say they touch the system for two reasons and two reasons only. Every morning they check was the backup, incremental backup successful. You're going to do that on any system. And that's a minute check. Check an email because it could send out an alert with the, the success or failure of the backup. And then if somebody joins or leaves the organization, the group, they have to get privileges because you don't want to just have everybody get privileges. That's it. That's all they do with the system. Nielsen is, um, so Nielsen does um, TV ratings. So if you are, you want to buy advertising, you know, a radio commercial, a TV commercial, you can contact Nielsen and say, I want to go after the demographic of 25 to 30 year old males. What's the best place I can advertise for under $500,000? Well, it's definitely not the Super Bowl. But they can give you a breakdown, and they can run queries and anal analysis of who's listening to what, who's watching what. And previously, they ran models to basically determine this breakdown of the demographics of people listening and what percentage of the demographic was to different systems. It took them 24 hours. So if you called, their salesperson looked at a spreadsheet from last night, and that's it. And all they had was that information, that simple report demographic. Now... Their, their reports run in 10 seconds on the Natiza platform. So what they've done is they've actually opened the system up with a GUI interface with a, with, from the web to all of their customers. So their customers don't have to call Nielsen and say, I want you know the best 25 to 30 year old males. They sign into their account and they issue interactive reports. They're running 800,000 queries a day from all these users, from 15,000 users instead of one big thing taking 24 hours and living off a static report. So they can say, you know, I want 25 to 29 year olds. Well, what if I expand that and go 25 to 40? How's it gonna change? They can tweak that as they're going through it and automatically. So the customers get more value immediately and they don't have to do any tune. They could actually get rid of a lot of their sales, you know, their phone sales support because the customers get interactive with the system through a web tool. Euronext, they do the clearing, the fraud detection on the New York Stock Exchange, over a petabyte on the Pure Data System for Analytics, and they're running every night. They're scanning through 650 plus terabytes of data looking for fraud. So if you take that 128 gigabytes a second versus 38, now you're scanning your data that much faster. The faster you scan the data, the faster you get the insight from it. Catalina, anybody that has a, you know, I guess if you're from Pennsylvania, Giant Card, Tenardis isn't around anymore, they sold all of them out to Giant, uh, CVS, Walgreens, any of those, you're in Catalina. I was actually in the local Giant the other day and I heard this woman who was in her 50s and I was just totally shocked, she's checking out, she gets the receipt and she goes, Catalina didn't like me today. It's like, <laughs> how does she know? <laughs> because, you know, Catalina's one of our customers and they store, they um, have over, it's over 225 million customer accounts. So if you have a card from Giant, CVS, Rite Aid, you have three, so you're in there three times. They don't correlate them between the stores. They're three unique accounts. So they have over 250 accounts. I think it's probably close, closing, closing in on 300 now. But what they're doing is they're doing that next best offer because they're running models on all of the data to find correlations between product A and product B. So what, they, what they're able to do, and I think it's on this next slide, which really breaks it down. So they have, if you get no target, you get a coupon, which basically just says, come to our store and get 1% off or get 20% off item X. 
There's usually about a 1% redemption rate for that. If you say, you know, if you buy, if you go to the store and you say, I want to give a coupon for a flea collar for anybody who buys a dog leash, or, you know, if anybody buys dog food, give them this. That's sort of a target. You've done some analysis of your customer, you know them, and you can say if they buy X, give them something for Y. There you get about a 6 to 10% back. What Catalina has been able to do during their, doing their predictive modeling is get up to almost is over 24% redemption rate. Because they know your exact three years worth of transactional history of everything you bought. And they can correlate that. They run these 600 predictive models to find the correlations. That's 10 times as many as they were able to run on their Oracle system. And they're running from four hours to 60 seconds to score a model. So 240 times faster. Every coupon is individual to the user. So this one on the right, this targeted, that's Amazon. I got an email when they came out with the Kindle Fire, not this new generation, the previous generation. Came out with the thing, you know, come to come to us, get 10% off. So I bought one for my wife. She didn't like it, I returned it. I got emails from them every two weeks for six months. We got the Kindle Fire, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, if they had just looked at their history, they would have seen I returned it, and they're wasting their time sending me that. Now, email doesn't cost them anything, who cares? But if you were spending money to send me something in the you know, through the mail, 40 whatever cents it is, 50 cents now, I guess, you know, that's a waste of money. You're optimizing your results. So them not just doing that random targeting, but, you know, Amazon has millions of hundreds of millions of customers. So they get 1%, they're happy. They're not doing the optimization, though, to drive that to the 24, 25%. And this is XO. I talked with them earlier, where they, you know, up and running for six months before they even said, should is there any training we need? No. Hire Frank. <laughs> um, two hundred over two hundred times faster. Well, you know, there's queries that never finished on Oracle. That um, roaming query that just never finished, could never finish on the Oracle system that they were able to run, and less than three months. Well, by the time they bought the system and paid for it, it had already more than paid for itself by them recouping that money for that roaming issue. So, you know, again, it's, when you talk about your data, you really have to drive into all the capabilities. You want to look at historical reporting, you know, static reports. But what you want to drive into is real time and predicting and optimizing the future. And that's where the power of moving the analytics to the data, not having to sample it, using the power of all the hardware you have, that's where the, this brings that power to your system. So with that, um, do we want to open up for some questions? Yeah, if the moderator wants to maybe read... Some of the or the first question that popped up, we'll uh, address it here, or I could read it. Okay. Um, can you speak to why and when someone would use a dupe map reduce and how it fits into the analytic strategy with Natiza de development deployment? deployment? Okay, so with one of those 200 plus analytic functions that exist in the Natiza box is actually map reduce. But that map reduces on data within the Natiza box. So if you have structured data in your Natiza system you've brought in, you can write a SQL call. You can write UDXs. You can make one of the regular function calls, any of those analytic function calls, or you can call a map reduce call. And map reduce, even on that structured data, has perfect cases where it makes a lot of sense. So the one place that makes, a, makes perfect sense for that is network analysis. Now, not network as in TCP, TCP IP network, but social interactive network. So understanding, if I'm a telco, I have tracking, who do you text, who do you call, who do you email, maybe, you know, if I, if I look at it a little deeper, who do you interact with on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, so I can compute your cone of influence, your sphere of influence. So you might only interact with five people, but if one of those has a million followers on Twitter and retweets what you say 90% of the time, then... I want to give you extra special attention. So if you're, you're a telco, and this is one of our customers is doing this, they're looking at churn, customer churn. So if Michael has a follower, Lady Gaga is one of Michael's followers, mm -hmm. and she retweets what he says a bunch, Michael starts getting dropped calls, I'm going to call Michael and say, Michael, you know, get rid of that crappy Blackberry that you carry, and here's a brand new iPhone 5. And, you know, we're going to give it to you for free, and we're going to give you a month free. 
Michael's going to get out and say, geez, um, my cell phone provider X just gave me an awesome deal. Lady Gaga is going to treat that to her million plus followers and look at the instantaneous. We didn't lose Michael. Michael might only spend $50 a month, but Lady Gaga probably spends a lot more and all her followers spend millions and millions of dollars that could have been lost if we just ignored the fact that Michael was losing calls and eventually said, I'm switching to company Y. So that Hadoop or that MapReduce analytics there is where you would use that. Writing that same thing in, in MapReduce was four to five lines. SQL was over 500 lines to try and write that same thing. And it doesn't perform as well because it's a recursive type thing. Um, when you talk pure Hadoop though, the regular unstructured data Hadoop, the way I consider it is the data in your structured data in your warehouse is data of known value. It came from your transaction system. It came from a point of sale system. So you know there's value in every transaction. In Hadoop, you get a whole bunch of data, like I said, tweets, Facebook posts, whatever, that you don't know if there's any value there or you don't know. So, But when you do go through and you scrape through, you can run the same analytics on Hadoop as you do in your database, PMML4, predictive, any of those analytic functions. Um, when you find data value, why not move it into the data warehouse so you can keep refining it? But you don't want to throw it away. You still want to keep it on your Hadoop appliance because, you know, three months from now, you might find, well, there's, you know what? This column is actually correlated to that one and has a big factor. So then you can go back out to your Hadoop system with all your data and pull it into your structured system for that refining and that constant anal analytics and analysis on it. I, I think from our experience, from MicroStrategy's experience, we've seen sort of a co-mingled implementation whereby you have the Hadoop landing your unstructured data, you mine for the gold, and you place it into the new teams, therefore you're pretty much your detailed analytics. Yep. So therefore you kind of have this two-step of process so that you're, you're leveraging the TESA for its ultimate or um, focused power, and you're leveraging the Hadoop for its openness and scalability and for also cost factoring. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that, you know, there's a whole bunch of data that is, you can throw away, that is irrelevant. So IBM also has a, a tool called Infosphere Streams. So if you look at machine generated data, sensor data, the Airbus A380 generates over 12 terabytes of raw sensor data for every hour of flight. Do you want to store that in a structured warehouse? No, because most of it is irrelevant. When's it relevant? Well, if the if that you know that's the one with the crack in the wing. Unfortunately, that's what was one of the things with the 380s. Anytime there's something out of range, out of the norm, then you go to the Hadoop. Then you may go to Hadoop, or you may go to, may go to both, and then bring it over to the Nateza side. Right. So they definitely have a there's a perp, Each one has a specific purpose, and they need to work collectively together. Yep. Uh, any other additional questions uh, on the internet, folks, or anyone in the room have a question for the speakers? Are there uh, particular use cases? One of the uh, fall announcements with IBM was with the digital analytics accelerator. Yep. And with the folks that I work with, I work in Clickstream, and we have yes. a few folks that are they're Unica customers, and now the next generation is to have the Nateza appliance. Correct, yeah. Do you have, um, do you have examples there of, of customers who have made that move over to the digital analytics accelerator? Um, yes. Um, so one of them is a large online shopping network, and they're actually correlating not just Clickstream, but also um, their phone. So they're actually using the system. Ah, sorry, I'm getting cramped in my leg. <laughs> um, they're actually correlating their calls because they have. You can do orders from both ways. You can call, phone them, and place an order, or you can get on the internet and place the order. So they're actually using the Nateza appliance and that network, the digital analytic appliance, to bring that data together and correlate their customer interaction between both. The other real cool thing they're doing is they're looking at when you have people on the air. So this is taking and this is using the Infosphere streams. They're converting voice to text. So you take the thing, you build a, a handler that converts voice to text. Not 100%, but close enough. And then they're mining that words that people are saying to the volume of calls and orders and interaction on the internet. Because if you can say, you know, you know, there's a woman on there and she says, that dress makes you look thin or makes, you know, makes your, you glow or something, they can get a keyword and then if there's a reaction within 
10, 15 seconds that where there's a spike in calls or a spike in internet traffic, they can they all of them are wearing an earbud. Say that word again. Say that word again. Say that word again. And they'll mine that for the rest of that sales cycle. So, but they're correlating again the web traffic, the phone. That's important, if, especially since they have both ways of interacting with the company. If you're web only, it's easy. You've, you've eliminated a whole half of that equation. But for them, it was harder because they have those two ways of interacting. <clears throat> okay. Any final questions? I have one on the new appliance or the. Uh... Yeah, the new appliance. Um, you said the resiliency has been improved. Has, does that include a disk regen? Because I know that's pretty intensive right now. Yes. So the, with the, the disk regen, the, there still will be a regen. But what we're using now is about almost three times as many smaller drives and faster drives. So the regen time would be a half or less of what it is now. So has that gone solid state? It has not gone solid state. So we, we looked at solid state, but, you know, and, and we've been looking at solid state for, for a number of years, and we just do not feel that it's at the resiliency level or the price performance level yet. The cost of solid state is astronomical still. Not, well, it's not as astronomical as it was two years ago. It's still really high. So to build a system with that much capacity or even a part of that capacity would be three to five times more. So we believe that we can build a system still with spinning disk technology that will derive and deliver the same or better throughput than an SSD system at a lower cost using this technology. Okay. The other thing is we don't believe that there's enough people have been in the work, in industry, using solid state for warehousing workloads yet to determine what the failure rate is going to be. What's the failure profile? Because solid state and flash have a write limit. One of the big things you do, I mean, you load data in a warehouse. So you think the tables are pretty static. You're not going to hit the write limit. But what do you do when you're querying it? You create temp tables like crazy. Some customers write temp tables to, uh, to do anything. Their ETL process is the creation of 52 temp tables. We won't mention names. Um, but it's, you know, or, or hundreds of temp tables, if, especially, I know customers that have migrated over from Sybase, that every query is the creation of a temp table, run it inside because they wrote everything in Sybase as a stored procedure, which created a temp table, and then they query from the temp table, select star from the temp table. So there you're doing a whole bunch of writes. So what's the failure profile? We have systems we're testing to figure out what that is. But right now, we don't know enough of the failure profile and we don't know you know we believe that the cost price performance ratio is still too high great so thank you all for joining you know we'll feel free to reach out to me anytime it's michael shuckman and we'll reach out to you as well and uh, enjoy the rest of your day thank you